Jeff has a microphone, I have the other one, we'll come to you. Uh, so in the past I've introduced the panelists, but that never works out very well. So what I do instead is I ask the panelists to introduce themselves, to tell us who they are and why we should pay any attention to them whatsoever. And after that I will ask the first question and then it's up to you. So we'll start with you. Oh, actually you, yes, use that one. Is it working? <laughs> This is just like work. IT comes all the time. Hello? Okay. I think we're good now. Can everyone hear me? Okay. First of all, thanks everyone for coming out. It's really exciting to see so many people um, willing to come out on a nice June day to talk about um, things that you can't see. So I'm Sarita Fry. I'm a professor in the environmental science program at the University of New Hampshire. And um, my research interests are uh, around or about the microbiome of trees and soils. So in particular, I'm interested in the fungi that live in and around the roots of trees. And um, I think I'll leave it at that for now. And then we can... Yep, so I have a lab in Durham and um, with about 12 graduate students and postdocs and undergraduates. And um, most of our work is done at the Harvard Experimental Forest, which is in central Massachusetts. And there we are running a number of long-term experiments looking at different, um, primarily global change, um, environmental changes or global changes on microbes that live in soil. And so we're looking at simulated climate warming, and I can talk about how we do that if you're interested, although that's not the exact topic of tonight. Um, we are looking at atmospheric nitrogen pollution and the impacts that it's having on forest soils and trees, and we also look at invasive plants and a number of other, um, again, a number of other global change factors that impact what's happening in the soil. Hi, I'm uh, Tom Wessels, and I'm a terrestrial ecologist which means I study land-based ecosystems. Um, I think I'm best known for my work in forest ecosystems, uh, looking at forest disturbance regimes, but I have a lot of interest in desert, alpine, and arctic ecosystems as well. And um, so I'm sort of a generalist, and I guess uh, I'll be here to answer any questions that come up. From the Society for the Protection of New Hampshire Forests, I'm Dave Anderson. Um, I've learned a lot from Tom Wessels, and I haven't met Sarita. I'm a generalist tonight. They're specialists. I've been at the Forest Society for 30 years, running field trips, workshops, slideshows. We're our land trust, based in Concord, been statewide, and we have 185 properties. It's 56,000 acres, and I run field trips and do education programs around the state, and also work a little bit in the media, which is what David does. That's why I met him. Um, I write for the uh, New Hampshire Sunday News column called Forest Journal and uh, host Something Wild on NHPR and uh, enjoy working in the woods. I have a 50-acre certified tree farm in Sutton, and that's the place where I um, get to apply some of the things that uh, I learn about, and, and it's an experiment, and look forward to tonight's conversation. Oh, you, you people are efficient. All right, usually I have to shut them up. All right, terrific. Well, I'll, I'll ask the first question, and as I indicated, I'll ask it of you. Since I, I mentioned it in the column, and it's kind of the the... the the sexiest thing that's, that's come up, and frankly, which sort of prodded my interest in having this, it was research that seemed to indicate that using biomes, and, um, sorry, microbes in particular underground, trees were communicating with each other in ways that we had not expected. So um, is that true? And if so, how? And if not, why not? So I'm, can I ask a question first? Oh, absolutely. Uh, what a professor, oh, for crying out loud. So how many of you are aware that 90% of plants on the planet associate with fungi called mycorrhizae? Whoa. Excellent. Okay, so um, the answer is yes, that can happen. There's still a lot of research being done in this area about whether and to what extent plants, 
trees and, and other plants communicate with one another. And to some extent, I have to say it's still a bit controversial. So you will find scientists who think that this is oversold in the popular press or in the media. Um, so it's an open question, but there are certainly studies that have documented that um, trees, for example, through their mycorrhizae, through the fungal symbionts that are associated with their roots, that they can provide sugars, for example, to um, a sapling or a seedling in their understory to give it a little bit of a competitive advantage. Um, so these are so-called nurse trees that will sometimes, or, or that have been shown to provide understory plants with carbon. Um, the plants in the understory also have been shown to provide larger trees with nitrogen and other nutrients. So the short answer is yes, there is documentation that this occurs. Um, it's been referred to as the wood wide web. Um, <laughs> um, but again, the extent to which it happens in nature is still subject to debate. So this, this, this image of, you know, a uh, a tree, the insect comes in this part of the forest and trees on the other side of the forest are warned and they start generating defense mechanisms. Is that true? Again, there are a few studies that have documented that on a small scale. Whether that's happening writ large is still an open question. I don't know if Tom has other. Yep. Yeah, I think that uh, that is true. That was born out in a study done at Penn State University in 1981. It was during our gypsy moth outbreaks in this area. So any of you that lived around oak woodlands back in the early 1980s remember our trees being defoliated. So researchers at Penn State wanted to figure out how quickly oaks could boost the amount of tannin in their leaves because that's a deterrent to herbivory. So they set up an experiment. Um, they had a group of experimental trees, a group of control trees, and um, in each group, they took a leaf off of each tree, tested it for tannin levels, and the tannin levels were pretty much the same in all those trees. And then in the experimental trees, they started ripping up the leaves in little tiny pieces as if they're being eaten by caterpillars. And sure enough, the uh, tannin levels in those trees' leaves started spiking. But being good researchers, they had a control group, and they took leaves off of those trees each day and tested them, and they were spiking at the same rate. But that group was about a half mile away across a highway system. And they figured out that when were, these leaves were getting ripped up, an aerosol, you know, sort of a, 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 a probably a plant hormone or, or chemical communicator was being released in the air. And if neighboring trees were picking it up, it informed them that yes, munching insects were coming and they pinned it down. In oaks, it's jasmonic acid. If oak leaves are chewed on, jasmonic acid is released and neighboring oaks will get that message and start boosting their uh, tannin levels. So uh, Tom wrote a book, Reading the Forested Landscape, which I highly recommend, and I took his course at Antioch and learned a tremendous amount. I'm sitting next to a living Lorax, right? Maybe two living Loraxes. Um, in his slideshow, he has a picture of a hemlock stump that was cut. And yet it continued to close the wound and grow for many grow for many more years. But there's not a single thing. It's a living stump. And that proves the uh, the ability of nurse trees nearby to send resources to that stump and keep it alive and uh, without any photosynthetic capacity of its own. So there's root grafts, there's communication in the soil, there's communication in the air, and uh, All right, uh, we can go for questions. By the way, if we're talking about books, uh, you also wrote Forest Forensics, right? Which is just a, a tremendous book. If, if, if I'm not a woodsman at all, and um, I love that book. It, I, it, it explains, when you see things in the woods, what history might have led to them and how you can use, the, use what you're seeing to determine what happened there 100 years ago. Great book, very accessible to the ignorant among us. Questions? Come on, people. I told them, you're never shy here. No. We'll come to you next. Hi. Just. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, you. No, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I, I work with you. Oh, uh, so you don't want to talk to them? Okay. Um, just as a side note, um, I'd heard, was it uh, on June 1st, Saturday, on Radio Talk, they had done something, they were talking. And I just got the last part of the program, and they talked about how they had had 46 trees with interconnected roots, all not the same. And they were talking about how um, 
that was moving the uh, various nutrients back and forth through. And then they also talked about how there were trees that were not doing well and other trees that would be sending nutrients, they would sort of send back and forth to the weaker trees. Um, but it was the same program, so when we heard about, I heard about this. I never did look at it, but it was radio talk, June 1st from two to, two to three. Um, but they'd also done, because I guess radio talk is done outside of, or in New York City, they'd actually done some of the stuff at Central Park. And Would that, that be Radio Lab by any chance? Ra radio yeah, Lab, yeah, yes. Yeah, sorry. Um, but part of mine was also that I'm um, talking about the, the pheromone, you know, going back and forth between trees. Um, I, I try to be a gardener, and I know they talk about how there's something given off by tomatoes that will actually stunt peppers. So gardeners, you know, there's various things, you know, was it carrots like tomatoes, I think is the book. Um, but I've got, I know I've been trying to grow um, blueberries, and they do well around the pines and other things, but the beach has a tendency to sort of, I mean, they're not right by the beach, but I'm finding suckers growing up, so it seems to be choking them out. Is that, well, is that just something that's happened, or is that actually just by accident? So how much is of this, this tree interaction do we understand and can be controlled and used to, to grow things or not grow things? Well, I, I can't respond to the horticultural questions about tomatoes and peppers, although now I'm thinking that maybe my peppers are too close to the tomatoes because they're not doing well. Um, but in terms of, um, let's say, pine and blueberries, these are, are species that really rely on mycorrhizal fungi. So... If they're growing close together, they're going to be sharing that mycorrhizal fungi, and there's going to be that relationship that takes place because of that sharing. Uh, beech is a tree that root clones. And if you have beech that are not healthy, if they have beech bark scale disease, they're going to be sending out a huge amount of their rhizominous roots and sending up clones, and that is really going to start choking off that area. So I'm guessing that they're very healthy. Well, they still send out a pretty intense root system, um, so I, I, in that case, I'm not sure what's going on. If they were, if they were sickly, I would say basically you're getting a really dense network of rhizomes in there that would be probably uh, competing with the blueberry. But Sri, do you have an idea about that with the beach? Okay. Like Tom, I can't necessarily address your specific question, but plants produce all sorts of interesting phytochemicals, some of which are toxic to other other plants. Um, so for example, I study garlic mustard, which is an invasive plant in New England forests. And the way that it outcompetes native plants is that it produces um, glucosinolates, which it puts into the soil, and it is actually anti-mycorrhizal. And so it inhibits the mycorrhizae of native seedlings so that, and it itself is amycorrhizal, it's non-mycorrhizal. And so by by producing these toxic compounds and putting those into the soil, it can outcompete native seedlings, which then have a hard time germinating if they're in a garlic mustard invaded stand. So that's not getting to your question exactly, except to say that, yes, plants produce a lot of chemicals that they either release as volatile organic compounds, so Tom alluded to that in his earlier point, or that they put out through their root system um, that can be toxic to other things. So, you know, we hear as gardeners that you should plant marigolds, for example, in certain places that are um, anti, they're, you know, nematocytic or whatever, they're, they're toxic to nematodes. So, again, can't answer your specific question, but there's a lot of that going on. So you have to be careful that you're not confusing soil chemistry with mycorrhizae because if you go into a natural pine forest, the understory is dominated by low bush blueberry. That's an acidic thing because the needles of conifers are acidifying the soil and blueberries can win by default and other plants won't compete there. The classic example of an allelopath where a plant is basically controlling the ground using chemical warfare is um, hay scented fern. And I've seen this in sugar maple stands that are managed for sap production where the entire understory is dominated by a fern mat and you're not getting any regeneration because the hay scented fern has a root chemical in allelopath that inhibits the germination and growth of any competing vegetation. That's why 
you'll see these beautiful sugar maple stands, and it's almost barren, nothing but uh, hay scented fern in the understory. So there are soil chemistry issues, there's uh, allelopath issues, and, and that's not necessarily like the mycorrhiza. I think of that mycorrhiza network as being like, but without it, some trees can't live at all, and they require it. So that's why you can't dig up a um, moccasin flower, a pink lady slipper, without bringing along a huge amount of soil. They don't succeed. So I think of the telephone of the 1960s that was an old dial phone. You know, there wasn't a lot of communication, and it was face-to-face -face or you know, an old-fashioned phone compared to today's um, social media and the degree to which everybody's connected instantaneously across the entire country. You can increase the surface root area of a tree more than tenfold by having them tap into a fungal network. And it's not just nutrients, it's also water that they're able. So they're basically getting a boost from their partners, and some of them are obligate in they're related to a specific fungi, and others are a little bit more generalist in terms of tapping into the soil fungi. There's two quotes I wanted to share brief. Um, the first one was from Jack Ward Thomas, who was the head of the US Forest Service in the 1980s. He was a spotted owl biologist during the old, you know, old growth versus spotted owls debate. He was the first non-forester to head up the US Forest Service, and he said, forests are not only more complex than we think, they're more complex than we may be able to think. And then the other quote, I've heard attributed variously to Harvard ecologist Theo Wilson, but I can't, I can't find that, I can't confirm that. And he said, now that we've explored the craters of the moon and the deepest recesses of the Marianas Trench and the mid-oceanic rift of the Atlantic Ocean, maybe it's time we start to look into the microscopic wilderness and the single teaspoon of forest soil in our own backyards in the Northeast. And so we are really at the beginning of trying to understand what's going on unseen in the, in the forest world. I guess this question would be for all of you. Um, of question. all the things that you've learned about the hidden life of trees, what do you, what have you found to be the most surprising or impressive or astounding? Uh, I don't even know where to start because that has been my whole professional life is trying to understand what's happening, not so much just specifically with trees, but with the microbes, like I said, that live in and around the roots of trees and other plants. And I guess for me, the, the most um, interesting thing most recently that, that we're starting to understand is the number of microbes that actually live inside trees, not just on their roots, but um, in their leaves, in their stems, in their trunks. So the endophytes, these are fungi and potentially bacteria as well that live inside the plant. And um, we're just beginning to understand what their role is. and we think, or there's some evidence that they confer drought resistance to, to some plant species, that they are important for nutrient acquisition, but we don't really know exactly what they're doing there, how they get there, and what their function is. Just, just picking up on that, I, I won't even just talk about trees, I'll talk about us. Um, about 10% of our body weight is not us, it's other organisms, uh, in fact, the number of cells in our bodies uh, of other organisms dwarfs the number of our own cells. And I think this is true with all organisms that were, you know, these composite ecosystems of all these different things. Now, I guess for me, in terms of what I've learned about forests that has sort of um, been the most wide-eyed experience was when I was an undergrad at UNH in the, early, in the late 60s, I was taught that trees only compete. And then Susan Seamard's work was coming out out of British Columbia showing that it's way more complex than that. And Dave said that, you know, we may be in our infancy of really understanding these ecosystems. That was the wake up for me that yes, this was like a, a, a real shocking thing that just 20 years ago, we found these networks where energy and nutrients were going back and forth at different times between species. And it, um, it just said, well, these are way more complex and uh, way more intriguing systems than we'd appreciated. So I, I like this emerging field of conservation sociology. You've heard of conservation biology, which is saving ecosystems for species, but conservation sociology looks at the nexus of human societies with natural systems. And the most astounding thing that I've been interested in is 
how the tree chemicals, and especially these, um, these molecules that float around in the air affect us as kind of an ancient medicine cabinet of well-being. And if you look at the chemicals, pinene, lemonine, terpenes, um, eucalyptus oil, some of those uh, organic chemicals actually have a profound effect on human dispositions and wellness. And there's been studies done on the effects of forest and forest chemicals on the levels of cortisol, which is a stress hormone, and reducing stress. And they've done all kinds of studies where they've taken stressed out Japanese businessmen and stuck them in a forest to do <laughs> forest bathing. You know, you've heard of forest bathing? Shinren Yoku. Um, and they've looked at how their cortisol levels have responded. And they've looked at um, rates of healing in hospitals and therapeutic settings where there's uh, access to green space. And it turns out that we, so the first, the first conifer showed up about 270 million years ago, and they were around for 170 million years before the first deciduous tree showed up about 100 million years ago. Surely we as a species have co-evolved in the presence of trees and forests, and surely there are relationships developed between our own well-being and our own physical health and living in forests um, where we're breathing these compounds. It's really an experiment we're in now where we're not living in forests. We're living in urban environments surrounded by asphalt and you know, all the rest of it, built infrastructure. So what's really astounding is they're discovering the profound effect of the medicinal quality of forest air in reducing stress and improving rates of healing. And there is a real profound um, need to begin to talk about forests as a solution, an antidote to the modern condition, and for people to appreciate the effects on human health of these chemicals. So how many people have hugged a tree? <laughs> All right, okay, good. Hi, thanks for coming. Um, really enjoying this. I had a question when I think about... A little closer. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, people interacting with the forest, like you had talked about eucalyptus and different things and how walking in the forest helps stress and all those other things. One of the things I, I was curious about, are there, do you guys know of any other relationships? When you see poison ivy growing, you always see jewelweed, and jewelweed's kind of like the antidote, I guess, to getting rid of the poison ivy oil. So I didn't know if there were other, like, I guess I'm curious to know how that kind of works, because you kind of pretty much always see poison ivy, and you always see jewelweed. Do they have some sort of relationship, and are there... And are there some other relationships out there as far as so other what, what plants? What do you call it? Homeopathic medicine, where there's two things that are counter. There's a word for it. That well, but jewelweed actually will dissolve the oil that causes the right. rash yep. on it. So I'm just curious to know, like they always seem to grow together. So I'm yeah, wondering if there are other. Full sun. So if you open up a wetland area to full sun, you're going to get jewelweed, and also poison ivy loves disturbance, and so natively it would have occurred all over Cape Cod. So it's something that. Um, thrives on edges and disturbances, and so both of them are edge species. So, so it really has nothing to do with their, rela I, I, their, I, I, their relationship, just to be their, their growth? That's what I think. Have, yeah. can, can I ask, have you ever tried the jewelweed thing with poison? I, I know people who have. Really? They, they, you have? They, you, I've never had the nerve to try it, but. I've known people, well, I know people that have um, poison ivy in their yard, yeah. and they use it, they use it after, yeah. oh, but they've used commercially grown, yeah. pro commercially made products with the jewelweed in it. Okay. So I was just going to mention there are a lot of sites where they don't occur together. So uh, poison ivy does well in uh, sort of enriched, moist soils, but also does really well in really dry, acidic, sandy soils. And when you get in those sorts of sites, you're not going to find jewelweed, because jewelweed is very much uh, specialist on, on rich, moist soils. So not in all sites where you find them both. All right. Um, well, actually, we're getting near the end. I want to ask a question. So I read a novel many years ago. I forget what it's called. But part of the, one of the plot points was the evil timber corporation was breeding a tree specifically to generate more chemicals around it that would kill all the other trees. So it could, you know, it would dominate the forest more quickly and it, and it would grow faster and they'd be able to cut it. Is that something that's that's feasible? I mean, we, you were talking about some plants produce chemicals that, you know, inhibit other growth. Uh, is this something that could be bred for or should be bred for, is being bred for? Do you know? Well, I'm looking at anybody. 
I don't know, but I would go back to Tom's point about being conservative because that would be a, a situation like with the garlic mustard that has come in from Eurasia where it's not an invasive in its native range, but where when you bring it here, the microbial community is not adapted to the phytochemicals that that um, plant is producing. So I think there would potentially be all sorts of um, unintended and potentially yeah, unintended consequences. Well, I didn't say it was a good idea. I just wondered if it was an idea at all. Well, I, I don't doubt it's an idea, and I don't doubt that some people may pursue that. Um, I don't think it's a good idea. No. Um, I think that that's strictly about extraction and using an ecosystem as a monoculture, um, which would not be a healthy system. It would all just be about monetary gain at that point. So um, I, I don't think it's a good idea at all. But I don't doubt that... There are people thinking about things like this because um, that's a driver sure. for a lot of what happens in this world. All right. Let, maybe a last question from Ralph there. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, I'm, I was going to ask, could you talk a little bit about how our forests are changing? Uh, our red oak forest is being supplanted on our land by beech, for example. So red oak is a transitional type, and beech is a late successional shade tolerant species. So forest succession that relay rates from an open field through pine, through oak, and then releasing a more shade tolerant, able to reproduce in its own shade beech forest is sort of the natural continuum and then it gets knocked back through some kind of cataclysm. Um, and taking Tom Wessel's Reading the Forest and Landscape was a textbook for his New England Plant Communities course at Antioch, and he taught us in terms of disturbance regimes. And so here's what's changing. When you talked about fires, that's exacerbated out west by hotter, drier summers and warmer, wetter winters that are allowing pine bark beetles to occur at elevations they never occurred before where the pine trees weren't adapted. And you've got whole mountainsides covered with dead pine, and that's a fuel load that is unprecedented and these fires reach cataclysmic size. So that's a climate-related, insect-related forest fire, and these feedback loops happen. And I remember learning that you know, New England trees are adapted to disturbance regimes on hundreds of years. So on Cape Cod, the hurricane return intervals about 35 years, but in the White Mountains, it's about 100 years. And our last big one was 38. So we'll be due in 18 years, right? For another big, on average, uh, fire fires on, you know, forest fires in Southern New England, Southern New Hampshire, you know, on 75 to 100 year rotations. But in the White Mountains, you know, it's an asbestos forest. You could go out there and drop a, a whole box of kitchen matches in days of yore and not kindle a fire in that moist climate where they're getting 43 inches of annual precipitation. That's changing because of warmer, wetter winters, hotter, drier summers. The return interval of these disturbances, whether it's hurricanes, super storm standy, or you know, fires and you know, cataclysm, it's speeding up. We've juiced up the oceans and they're spinning off you know, faster curveballs coming off the Gulf of Mexico, slamming into Florida and Texas and coming all the way up into New England, we're literally fundamentally changing the disturbance regime and the return interval such that our forests will need to adapt. And our roads, indeed, you know, these rainfall events where we get six inches of rain in 48 hours, there's like, it's sort of unprecedented. So inducing up the atmosphere, we're changing the nature of the game for insects and all the plants that grow here that aren't adapted to that, you know, that climate regime. And on that depressing note, um, you got something optimistic to say here? I'm just going to say that, yes, in the short term, things are not looking good. But I can assure you in the long term, it's going to be OK. This biosphere has been around for uh, 3.7, 3.8, 3.9 billion years. It's thrived through that time. Uh, it's got a lot of more billion years to go. It will be fine. Uh, the difficulties are, evolutionarily speaking, in the short term. But they're daunting for us. Um, but um, if we take the right road, we can do our best work and hopefully restrict the impacts. Um, anything you want to say at the end? Or? The microbes will win in the end. <laughs> <laughs>